let me turn on Twitch. Hello and welcome, everyone. As you filter in, hopefully we'll get get a few more people. I know a lot of folks were planning to stop by today. Welcome to the Kudo Musicology stream, a little musicology literature review. And I am your host, musicologist, and with me today is the esteemed Dr. Karen <laughs> Cook. I'm so excited you're here. Um, even more excited that we are looking at this specific article because uh, it is, it's one that I, I, I feel like a lot of people maybe have missed because it was in post-medieval, like with it not being in kind of a game-facing publication. Um, or, you know, maybe they, they don't have access to that particular publication um, through the, the various various schools um, versus like your um, AMS blog post or things like that. So I think this is a really important one. Uh, it sort of is a nice extension of, of work we've already seen. And uh, it's just such a, such a wonderful article. So I'm really happy that we're featuring it. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah. And welcome to Andrew, who's our dear mod in chat here. <laughs> yeah. How was Belgium? <laughs> Belgium was was uh, early. <laughs> How early did <laughs> you have to But it's over go? with now. There's there's one last panel tomorrow morning, but it's not particularly relevant, and I'd have to be up at like four. So I was like, no, I think I'm done. I'm good. Ooh, done. How, How early was it today? I mean, they start at like three or three or four in the morning, but um, I didn't hop on uh, until like six. Boy. <laughs> Which is fine. I'm normally up by then anyway. Which is why I start turning into a pumpkin on stream like by ten. The mm. yawns hit me and last night I couldn't hold back. That was it was a fun one. Um Sebastian was just a delight, so it was it was really fun to to do that stream. But yeah. Um I guess just to start us off here, I'd love to hear a little bit about sort of where what was the genesis of this article? Where did this one come from specifically? Yeah. So this one was actually a request. Uh, I was contacted by Helen Dell, who's a medievalist uh, down in Australia, and she and some of some of us here on the stream have probably read uh, or know of Elizabeth Randall Upton, and maybe you've read her blog post on sounding out coconut clops. It's a great, great little article. Um, if you're into medievalism, that is not necessarily game music, but uh, the she, Helen Dell and Elizabeth Upton and Andrew Lynch were co-editing a special issue of the journal Post Medieval, uh, and they were, the title of the special issue was going to be Music, Emotions, and Medievalism, and they wanted to have something featured from the realm of video games. So they thought of me at the at the time, and basically the uh, the the gist was left up to me as to how I wanted to spin that, they had noted that they were really interested in stuff that focused on non-anglophone medievalism. Mm. Um, and there are some games in here that don't, you know, that are Japanese and whatnot, but I still like, for my kind of work, I have to be really careful about cultural background and cultural literacy and tropes and whatnot. So uh, that was less on my mind at that time because this they approached me back in like 2017. So we're talking this was five years ago that they were asking for it. Um, but yeah, so I basically ended up pitching them that that I was interested in looking at relationships between like these quote unquote opposite emotions. Uh, because with medievalist music in games, like I laid out in the article, it, these, these more obvious medievalist musical tropes kind of tend to hit a lot of the extremes. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting that, to me, that the same kinds of sounds or like families of sounds definitely connoted this idea of the past, but with opposite emotional states or opposite senses of like atmosphere. And I wanted to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, and a lot of that was somewhat stemming from what I had already been doing with chant, where I had noticed that a lot of chant operated in that way. Uh, like you've got the DS Eerie on the one hand and you've got, you know, the Halo theme song on the other. So I wanted to just see what else was out there that I could, that I could play with. And that's where this article came from. Excellent. Um, yeah. So this was really developing uh, your, your chant in video games, your, your DS Eerie stuff. Um, 
and so they they asked you to sort of put this together. Did you uh, feel like in the the process of bringing it to the final print version was there did it change significantly based on sort of the editor input or were there were there th- you know things that they had you bring out that you know weren't in there originally or I'm always interested in in hearing about like what was it pretty straightforward or you know did they send you on a different path at one point or anything like that? I mean, from what I can recall, they were pretty favorable the whole time. Um, I don't really remember getting tons of editorial input. Um, I know that uh, when I did get feedback after a while, I know that there was a little bit of pushback from an anonymous reader and and, and helpful and constructive, not snarky or anything like that, um, about uh, the organ. Mm. Uh, the organ section. So uh, I had to kind of be careful to to build that argument up a little bit more. Um, I got the feeling that people were a little bit more sold on the bells and the wordless voice, but the organ, some people didn't, um, or that, that one, a reviewer at least, wasn't sure that it really was a like a medievalist trope because it's so gothic. And so I had to kind of try to make the, the clearer connections between the gothic and the medieval. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. You know, so that that, um, you know, led me down to, to kind of beef that section up a little bit. But I, on the whole, I didn't I didn't ever got I never got any sort of feeling like they wanted me to go in a different direction or that they were concerned about the examples I was using or the kinds of music that I was choosing to analyze. They were all just, you know, very much in, in, in favor of it. That's good. That's always yeah. good to hear. I, I think that, you know, good good and bad, it's just, you know, we, we did this a lot in uh, the medievalism course this semester where we would sort of, folks would say, oh, I wonder why why they didn't talk about X, Y, Z or, you know, whatever. And I, I point out that, you know, this is never just one person putting something out here that like there could be there could be space reasons you know maybe they had something on that and they had to cut it for word count maybe the editors wanted them to highlight this over this like so it's always interesting to just see what the process looked like um it was it was pretty straightforward i know that um there were some foofaraws with getting readers to you know external reviewers to review in a timely fashion at that point i think people were really super busy took a little longer than expected but that happens all the time it wasn't really a big deal and about the only other i don't know what the right word is concern i guess was kind of us going back and forth on whether or not to include all these youtube links uh to to save space or how to, how to include links to audio so that people could understand and listen to the tracks that I'm mentioning. Uh, so we had kind of went back and forth on, on that aspect, but that has little to do with the content and more to, about formatting. So yeah, everybody, everybody liked it. Yeah. It nice. It's a good one. Uh, and we're going to watch a few of them. We're going to play at least one thing on emulator today, uh, oh, that we, I do own. <laughs> That's one of the nice things about the the retro games, the NES games, is Joe and I tend to own physical copies of all of them. So the emulators are truly, like they're supposed to be, a backup of physical copies. So <laughs> we'll be able to do that today. Um, so we'll just dive into a walkthrough of the, the article itself um, and with commentary along the way. Um, so our citation here is Medievalism and Emotions in Video Game Music, and this appeared in Post Medieval. Um, in 2019, and there's the DOI for anyone that wants to, you know, go dig that up. And then yeah, the, and the first I'll pass page. it along to people if anybody need anything. Just say the word. Yay! <laughs> Always a good thing. Um, and of course, we also do on my Discord. I have a space um, where we can also share links or resources. You know, if we want to have even more discussion after the fact. So if anybody is curious about more examples or anything like that, there's there's a space where we can throw any of that kind of stuff. I always like putting the first page too. I saw a few people do this at like Nakfagum where they were citing stuff and they just like put a picture of the first page of the article and I just thought it looked so good that I've now copped that for for my own stream. <laughs> All right, so it, as mentioned in the introduction, we're setting up that um, you're interested in emotional connotations of these medievalist musical choices instead of just kind of going, oh, look, here they are. 
<laughs> you know, what, like, so what? Um, so it's really interesting because like any medievalism, it's going to tell us a lot about sort of our contemporary interpretations and understandings of what the medieval is. Um, but particularly with the three tropes that we analyze here, Gothic organ, church bell, and wordless choir, what's interesting about them is they, they get used for opposites. So they can depict peace, tranquility, sanctuary, or danger, violence, the supernatural, and death. Um, and that's, that's interesting, like that they, they have this sort of like ability to flip or um, mm. they're polyvalent, as you say. Yeah. And so there is a section, um, because this was in post-medieval, uh, where, you know, I, I was like, oh, okay, cool. This is kind of situating it for the medievalist crowd, um, talking about immersiveness and interactivity and sort of how that sets gaming apart from other media. Um, and then I really liked your point here that all of the work that folks do on immersion, um, whether they use that term or incorporation or something else, that it always presumes this emotional investment or a sensitivity to the emotional content of the game as a prerequisite. Um, yeah. Sort of like you kind of can't have the immersive experience if you aren't connecting to what's in the game. Yeah, I mean, folks that have been around me for a while know that I have feelings about immersion as it's typically discussed which is that we tend to have, uh, and I hate to say we, I don't like blanket statements, but I, I feel like that word gets used way too much in ways that presume we're all on the same page with what it means. Yeah. And there isn't one single definition that is shared among people as to what it means. And so that word makes me grumpy. <laughs> it's a grumpy word. Um, like authenticity, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, like that's one of my grumpy words. <laughs> yeah, it is exactly. It's like immersion and authenticity. That should be the t the title of my next talk, in which I'm, I'm basically like, these words suck. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not like I disagree that there is such a thing as immersion, but I I tend to think that it is a very individual thing and a very fluid thing, and I I I appreciate people who put efforts into trying to quantify it. But unless we have an agreement on what it is we're trying to quantify, I still feel like all of those, um, you know, experiments and charts and graphs and whatnot are just mm, maybe a little inherently flawed, uh, which isn't me trying to throw anybody under the bus. I'm trying to be so careful because I do use work on immersion, but right. I still feel like it's like, but I could have a completely different experience tomorrow. Yeah. Where's that going to be in your research? So many of us just like we take immersion for granted, just like diegesis, just like, you know, authenticity. A lot of the, these terms, um, we're not if we're not focusing on them in the specific argument, it's like we just kind of forget about them. We take them for yeah. granted. We're like, OK, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, I know in my dissertation, I ended up um, instead of immersion, I used the incorporation model because I liked how that brought in the body and I was all about the body in that. So. Right. Um, I had to spend some time thinking about that, but there's plenty of plenty of spaces where you don't have any any space to do that. But you did it here in just a few sentences to kind of just point out that the player, and I think I say that on the next slide here, the player um, emotions might mirror what's happening. You know, if you see a really awful cutscene with loss, you know, a, a grief stricken moment, you may identify with that the first time you see it. But if you are replaying the game, you might uh, have totally different emotional responses. You might, you know, be like, okay, I know there's a tough fight coming up after this, so I'm anxious for it, or I've been on it for a while and I keep dying and I'm frustrated, or I'm a little bored right now, or I'm hungry, or I'm tired. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, you might have all of these other things kind of overlaid over that uh, emotion that you you no longer you know are yourself feeling sad even though you can appreciate that the character is having a sad moment right yeah that's one of my big reasons in this particular article where I'm saying you know I'm not I'm not worried I'm not trying to talk about what the audience is feeling I'm trying to talk about what maybe the game composers think they're doing or what are they trying to imply because that is something we can talk about we can talk about why did you make this choice here? Not let's all have a universal experience. Right. Yeah. And if you were interested in, in trying to talk about players, emotional reactions, really the only one you could do is your own. It ends up being kind of auto ethnographic at that point. 
um, which is, you know, totally valid in, in the right context. But it, uh, uh, there are a lot of assumptions that the player is going to feel this because these decisions were made. And I like that you you take a second to detach that and just say, no, I think that, you know, we're, we're trying to evoke these things and we can get at that not just from the musical choice, but from everything in the game, the gameplay and the, the visuals and the narrative. And um, we're all kind of hinting toward certain emotional states, but that doesn't mean that the player is going to have a universal reaction to it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I also just, you know, I, I know we want to move on, but I just, you reminded me about me setting up gaming for a medievalist audience. And I just want to, again, kind of just revisit that for a second yeah. in my head, because when I was reminded just in preparation for stream, it's like, well, when when was I asked to do this? When, when, you know, I know it came out in 2019, but how far before that was, when did, when did that in, invitation get extended? And when I realized it's like, you know, I'm being asked to do this in 2017, I'm starting to write this in 2017, and how even at that point, like think about how much of our literature has come out in the last five years. Yeah. Whereas even to non-medievalist audiences, I still still feel like a lot of us writing on game music five, six years ago still put in that caveat that here's why games aren't films. Right. You know, and I really like that we're getting to the point where maybe we don't have to keep re-explaining that every time we write a new chapter, but I know that for myself, those little snippets of games are interactive and players do things and therefore you know it's not passive like that stuff keeps sneaking into my work still you know because it was a habit that i think a lot of us got into of having to justify why this kind of work was necessary yeah or useful um and it, it's just weird to kind of sit back and reflect on that at this moment to be like wow you know that was five years ago five years doesn't seem like a lot but i think it reminds me of how much the field has changed yeah mm. i agree <laughs> and then you also hit on just one of the overall problems in medievalism studies here is right. <laughs> it's a really broad topic right we're talking about the reception of a period that can involve a thousand years or so of history um and as you point out the like medievalism started when before the period was over <laughs> before what we consider the medieval period was even over um we're having these reactions to earlier parts of the medieval um and then it's changed over the centuries um and so it's just such a massive massive topic it really is and you know for anybody that saw the keynote for ludo I mean, I really went into depth there explaining just how just how detailed and frustratingly long and lengthy and, and messy this topic is. So, whew, it's yeah, a lot. yeah, you really end up having to situate. And then if you're looking, you know, so late in in the sort of medievalist history <laughs> in, you know, 80s, 90s, 2000s video games, um, it's like okay i have to i have to recognize how many of these things are come are stemming from you know possibly centuries of of a crude tradition here right in how we right. uh, as you say here the study of medievalism and music investigates reactions to reuses or reconstructions of and creative interpretations of the medieval and i love that you say both deliberate and inadvertent yes <laughs> yeah so so much of you know what i'm what I really want to get across a lot of times is that people are like, well, that, that doesn't seem medieval to me. It's an outer space. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still medievalist. Like there are still connections and connotations that we don't see because they've become so blurred. Yeah. But it's like, it's like, remember those like uh, seeing eye puzzles that were real popular in like yeah. the early nineties or whatever. Magic eyes. Like, yeah. The magic eyes. It's like the, the minute that you learn just how to unfocus your eyes enough to see that picture, you can never unsee it. It's always there. And that's kind of what I feel like medievalism is. Um, it's like, as soon as you see it, you can't unsee it. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. It's a little, and there's so much of this, this mixing, um, we talked in the in our class too about how all these sources on medievalism talk about how well it really says more about today right that's like such a common refrain like this is our interpretation of the past or we're using the past as a symbol for certain things like 
you know, certain ideas about that era that it was more pastoral or, you know, simple or religious or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and we're using that in some way to like react to something in the present. And I, I pointed out to the class, what other genre really does that and is associated with that? Sci-fi. <laughs> So we we do that, but we're projecting into the future instead of projecting into the past. Um, right. But I mean, even like something like a Star Trek, right? So much of Star Trek, like look, thinking about like TNG is reflecting back on what we consider to be the present day. Mm hmm. To be like, oh, imagine those folks way back then doing all these things. How silly. Right. You know, or, or oh, they really had some nice ideas back in the 1900s. And people are, oh, such a long time ago. <laughs> Look at how all these things. It's the same thing. It's just that it's being spun from a different direction. Exactly. And it, But it also shows why, like, sci-fi and medievalism can actually pair in interesting ways. Like, you just said the space example where, you know, folks are like, I don't see that as medievalist. And you're like, well, actually, <laughs> it actually <laughs> well, plays actually really nice together because... Because, because they're both about this sort of projection uh, and response to the present moment, right? Um, and and similarly, it's like why why does space and cowboys go together? Why do we have the sort of like Western tropes showing up in sci-fi? Right. But uh, right. that's that's super common. So <laughs> we do have the these things that are going together because they yeah. they have a common thread. Exactly. So the medievalist musical, I, I had a hard time not just quoting like your whole article. <laughs> it's a problem. You wrote too well. I apologize. I'm pulling a lot of quotes. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. It's quite a pleasure. Yeah. An honor. I just loved this, this statement. Medievalist musical tropes are therefore often anachronistic, polyvalent, and located at the crossroads of timbre, visual imagery, and plot. Mm. It's just so beautifully stated. I couldn't restate oh, thank it. Thank you. Um, and as you point out so often when we're using these signifiers, it is to sort of set us in, um, medieval time and place, um, kind of a, even vaguely like in, in fantasy settings, like Game of Thrones isn't literally Western Europe, but, uh, it's setting us in that sort of generic sense of antiquity or what you call the unspecified pastness. Yeah. And I th I think doesn't Will Will uses that that kind of idea too like things sounding just like old enough <laughs> to kind of yeah tell us we're in the past exactly and he even does that with things that are uh, like more baroque classical right um, which which I think is really interesting that 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 works how how we musically and again I keep saying we because I don't have another good word but how people. Mm, Right, use different kinds of old musical tropes to distinguish between different kinds of pastness, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is really fascinating. And that's that's something that I pick up on in the chapter that I wrote that's coming out in the Oxford Handbook on is there such a thing as Renaissanceism? So like we're talking yes. about all this medievalism right now, but could is there a Renaissanceism? Why and why isn't there? Um, why why does that seem such like a weird concept? What do we do with Renaissance music and games? And it's a totally different way of conceiving musically of time. Uh, it even comes through when Andrew and I worked on medieval. It's mm -hmm. like we have all of these like big generic sweeping medievalist tropes like gothic organ. But then like the harpsichord is the thing that makes it clear that you're in the past. Right. <laughs> not not the medieval stuff, mind you. No. It's the harpsichord. It's the harpsichord. And it's like it's like what the what the heck? Um, so it's it's funny that the generic stuff is so it goes back to my point like it's everywhere it's so ubiquitous that of course it's going to be there but we hear these little slightly less common things and they become like oh there that's your signifier right there like mm -hmm. that that weirdly slightly unused thing is the Da Vinci Code a Renaissanceist book? Ooh, <laughs> I mean that's the thing. I yeah. think that I don't know that I really come up with a good definition for Renaissanceism. Uh, I'm you know, I'm more using it slightly tongue in cheek as a way of exploring, well, what, what do, what happens when we use Renaissance music in games? Right. What, what, what patterns can we note? Um, you know, what, what do the games tell us that we even think the Renaissance is? Uh, but is the Da Vinci Code medievalist? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> no, no, no question about it. Hands down. Absolutely. Um, but obviously are there Renaissance signifiers there too? Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the nice thing about medievalism is that it's yes and and not but or right right 
All right. This is what I kind of called your thesis um, because you you do a lot of like beautiful setting up to this point, but you know, it's not a single statement, but it's a few statements here. Music, uh, medievalist music also communicates stereotypes of the medieval past. Such stereotypes have permeated Western culture since the Middle Ages themselves. The medieval past was, on the one hand, pure, tranquil, simple, religious, unmarred by the noise of industry or booming urban spaces. On the other hand, it was barbaric, misogynist, superstitious, permeated by violence, illness, and early death. I don't know why I took death out of there. (laughs) Early death. (laughs) In supporting such attributes or emotional states, medievalist musical tropes took on a sort of bifurcated polyvalence, such that the same sound can act as a connotative cue for a particular meaning, and also its inverse. And I I believe the connotative cue was citing Gorbman, Claudia Gorbman, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she shows up in a couple of my articles. Although I really do need to engage with her work a lot more. Yeah, it's really, really excellent. So then I also like to identify what I call the walkthrough statements that in this chapter, I do this, <laughs> uh, which you don't even, you don't say that explicitly. You say, I focus here. <laughs> I focus here on three primary vocal, uh, vocal tropes. Vocal tropes. Is that right? Did I copy that down wrong? I may have copied that down wrong. I don't three. think I said vocal tropes. I don't think you did. I think it was primary. I hope I didn't. <laughs> primary something tropes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the church bell, the pipe organ, and the wordless voice, the frequency and consistency with which these tropes are used, whether by themselves or as part of a larger sonic amalgam across a wide variety of games, eras, genres, and topics to create such opposite emotional states marks them as a particular fruitful locus for analysis. Perhaps more importantly, though, these tropes cause us to reconsider vis-a-vis their symbolic relationship to the medieval, what exactly the medieval is. So kind of a continuation of our thesis idea, um, but showing us exactly we're going to go through these tropes as well yeah i think it's musical musical tropes i was kind of doing this late last night after the stream so (laughs) all right so then we get into our tropes the bell is our first one um which can represent all kinds of things sanctity safety order if we are talking about a church bell in a big church tower it's going to ring on the hour maybe marking the passage of time it can be rung for special occasions like funeral processions it can be used to signal alarms mark curfews um and later on, uh, beginning the Reformation, Reformation bells uh, begin being rung at the end of weddings to signify, yay, they're married. Um, so we, we have a positive association with wedding bells as well. But you note that bells also mark the area as Christian. What do you mean by that? That bells mark an area as Christian? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the stuff that I'm citing in the chapter, in the article, uh it, Basically, I'm trying to draw on how bells were used in in the past and the fact that many towns had some sort of a bell uh, that could be used back in the the all Catholic days, pre-Protestant Reformation days, right, where the, the bell uh, was your alarm system, it set curfew, but it also rang out the 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 hours, the the um, the divine office, right? So you'd know potentially when, you know, Matins was or Lauds was. So it marks the day, mm-hmm. uh, but from a liturgical standpoint. And there were some um, conceptions that you, the the sound of that bell thus carried some sort of like protective aura around it, such that if you're within earshot of the bell, you're covered, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're somehow protected as though you're within the city walls, right? But the moment you get a, out of out of earshot of that bell you're you're getting into the danger zone right yeah. because you've, you've gone too far away from the protected place uh but but that's all coming from a, a fairly like like religious point of view maybe not necessarily a theological one or a mm-hmm. liturgical one but uh maybe a, a sense of uh, like a spiritual one right mm-hmm. um so that's that's kind of what i'm going going for there yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, like you said, the, the reach of the bell almost like marks out the parish in some way. Mm-hmm. And then you have some some examples here. And one of them I, I just loved because, I mean, Octodad, Dadliest Catch, what a great title. Have you played that? <laughs> I have not. And now I'm going to because I've seen this clip. 
<laughs> it's uh, the, there's Octodad, and then I think this is the sequel, and they're really adorable games. I haven't played them entirely, but they're super cute. Yeah. We should do them on stream. Oh, that would be really fun. Uh, so this is 2014, and we have a sort of flashback playable sequence to Octodad's wedding. So we have bells showing up in the soundscape. Octodad looks very awkward to control. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's part of the point. Um, yeah. You have to walk down the aisle without like knocking over um, some of the decorations in the church. So let's watch a little bit of this. He's just running late. He's always late. But what on earth is keeping him? Mr. Groom, the wedding is starting. Are you ready? <laughs> kind of reminds me of Zoidberg from You're Futurama, too. Dressed. Yeah. Make yourself presentable. She's waiting for you. All right, so we're going to skip over him getting ready because I want to actually get to him uh, going down the aisle because that, that part is really amusing. He has to fetch a few things first. All right. Let's see. Is this it? There we go. I didn't think he was ever going to show up. <laughs> I love the wedding march being botched. <laughs> commentary as everyone you're hearing everyone talk yeah, it's a really cute game and then you have to get the banana peels out of the way <laughs> they're going to have such beautiful children <laughs> <laughs> Nervous because you're taking so long. There you go. Don't listen to them, honey. They're just fidgety from waiting. You're doing great. You're doing great. Ah, so there's Octo Dad for you. <laughs> I love that. So we we get bells and organ there. Um, the church organ. I I love how you know it goes into kind of the happier wedding march, but like the kind of stereotypical here comes the bride wedding march is like being played very poorly. Like the wrong keys are getting hit. I don't know if that's a reflection of how how you're doing. Like, if you knock something over, I don't know if that introduces, you know, the the wrong notes, or if that was just that section, and then it goes yeah. into the the other one. So we have, oh, we have that example. Then we have another wedding, um, but this wedding is much less happy because Bowser has, of course, stolen his bride and. Um, Mario is trying to rescue Peach, um, and Bowser took her all the way to the moon to marry her without her consent. Um, yeah, as one does. As one does. I, you know, they they make kind of a big deal about consent in most wedding uh, per processions um, that I've seen. They they ask explicitly whether folks are both here of their free will to join together or whatever. It's different wording depending on your denomination, but. Uh, that's usually a, a pretty big deal. <laughs> and in, I know in Catholicism, um, if, if, if that is, if that consent isn't there, you have like immediate grounds for annulment. It's really, really important that you're, you're coming to the marriage kind of properly prepared. So uh, in this case, we have some signifiers that tell us that this, this marriage is not happy and wished for, right? Um, and we can tell immediately based on sort of the timbre of the bells on the moon, and things like that. It has that kind of like tubular bell. It's got more of like a kind of a fateful like Ugh, gotta get there and stop the wedding, right? Mm. <laughs> and then I'm trying to remember when we actually get to the church. It's ever after hill. 
of course the gravity on the moon is real fun to to navigate you can jump real high yeah see so yeah, we have this very loud now that we're there the church bell's louder it's more present yes we do have organ Open that door, Mario. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Cappy. That ring looks a little too big for her. I'm just saying. <laughs> so yeah, kind of our similar tropes here with weddings. <laughs> All these people are like, I don't want to be here. Like I was dragged away. All of those things. So some good examples of uh, wedding, ex you know, two opposite sort of wedding examples. We have sort of like a positive wedding and uh, a negative wedding, but they're, they're using the, the same couple signifiers. So the bell can be used uh, a lot like medieval bells were to keep time, mark important occasions, alert danger. They imbue games with this sort of Christian symbolism, and then they can also um, be used for post-Reformation connotations of danger, violence, evil, and the supernatural. Then we get the pipe organ section, mm -hmm. um, and you point. This is, you know, maybe you can speak here to. You had kind of gotten some pushback on. Well, it's not. It's not a m medieval organ, and so you you specifically say this is a large Gothic pipe organ. It's not a med medieval portative organ. Yeah, and I don't really remember anymore what the specific nature of the pushback was. Only that the idea of a Gothic pipe organ being interpreted as a medievalist cue seemed potentially problematic or mm. or maybe not entirely like a good reading um i don't it's been so long yeah or maybe the idea know. that like the gothic is its own thing and it's not medievalism or something like that i don't even think it was gothic i don't think it was the gothicness particularly just the idea of this much later instrument me making the argument that this much later instrument somehow indicated the medieval. Yeah. A and I had to kind of try to, you know, explicate the relationships that this large organ, this, this much later musical device has had within literature and film and whatnot that kind of solidify this forced connection Yeah. with these medievalist themes. Um, that's not the instrument's fault. It's not something inherent to the instrument. Um, it's about how it's used, but when it's used in conjunction with these things, you know, I think we can safely look at it as a medievalizing element. Yeah. And I think That's here, hard. you know, I, I don't think it's wrong to, con uh, as we saw, it's often connected with bells in church settings specifically. So I, I, yes, it's a later instrument, but for a lot of people, organ represents like a Catholic church. Um, or, or even non-Catholic uh, Christian churches. A lot of a lot of churches have organs in them, and so I, I feel like for a lot of people, they wouldn't necessarily know that those organs weren't stretching all the way back to the medieval era. It's just like, oh, this goes with this church. This church has been around for a really long time. Therefore, and, and I, the perception of like non-Catholics with Catholic liturgy tends to be that it is like very ancient, and uh, you know stuck in its ways or or whatever um and because this type of music is showing up in these these environments that reinforce that connection cathedrals churches graveyards and crypts um so it's associating it um with those spaces and with you know religious ideas um but then of course graveyards and crypts lends itself to the gothic ideas and lends itself to connections with violence and death and fear and and all of those so right Similarly to our bells, we can signify supernatural elements, mysterious, sacred, ethereal, ancient, um, but also aspects of safety, healing, weddings, or, or just kind of a general sense of grandeur because of the, the size and the sound of the instrument. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pull up the Xanadu for a moment. Retro arch. All right. And then hop over here. Window capture. And then I will I'll share that over to you as well. Okay. Uh, PowerPoint. Stop 
streaming, restream, share screen, retroarch, go live. Is that working? It's a little loud. Hold on. Volume mixer. Good old retro arch. Let's try that. That's better. At least on my end. <laughs> it's still better. All right. So I thought I would just start off the game for us here. I mean, because all the music is just so good, right? It is. I love this game. If I can ever finish this article. <laughs> Alright, now if I go over here... I can get us to our sanctuary, our place of healing, and we're going to hear this very organ timbre here, which is beautifully played on the three NES channels of the pulse waves and the, the triangle wave. So we already have sort of like that three voice organ texture, like the pedals are in the triangle and I wonder what he's chanting <laughs> or praying. He blinks a lot. <laughs> Take the, this ring. He like blinks in time with what how he's talking. Maybe that's a code for me. Get out now. It's a sign that he needs help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's there against his will. <laughs> All right. I want to let it cadence again. And of course, we have our loop point there. Excellent stuff. Do, 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 do. On. There we go. So I had to had to play that in real time because you can get to it right at the beginning of the game. Yeah, we've got stained glass. We have our uh, kind of guru. They're gurus, right? In the they are gurus. Although in the original Japanese, everything was explicitly Christian. Oh, were they called priests or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. They were everything. Everything was explicitly Catholic -y Christian in the original Japanese, and when it got ported uh, to outside Japan, they removed all of the overtly Christian references. So there were crosses in that in the in the guru's church. I forget what they called it. Uh, it wasn't a guru. The priest's cathedral, cathedral the, the priest's mm -hmm. church or something like that. But yeah, like the bosses were devils and demons. Like there were a lot of, of Christian references. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty common as we know, because um, in America, Nintendo took out a lot of references to anything religious or substances. Hence right. why you get vodka drunkenski turned into soda popinski in the port of punch out, stuff like that. Right. All right. I loved your King's Quest examples because we get kind of two versions of playing the pipe organ. Um, mm -hmm. We get the what you describe as kind of like a Fantasia. Um, and then you get the sheet music and you come back and that one seems much more inspired by the uh, Toccata and Fugue in D minor that right. is used ubiquitously. Um, but here's the the initial thing that you can sit down to play. Um, these were both recorded on an MT32, if that matters. And it does, because if you look up, di you know, ones from different sound chips, different computers, um, the, the sound is very different. It, it actually makes work on PC gaming kind of difficult mm -hmm. because there are so many soundings that we can have. Right. Hmm. 
<laughs> what a virtuoso you are, Rosella. <laughs> like, yeah, he just sits down and busts that out. But then when you get the sheet music and come back, this is how it sounds. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> so on the nose. So funny, I get ads when I embed these, even though we pay for no ads on regular YouTube. It's got that kind of like dirgy <laughs> repetition. So yeah, this is this is the sheet music version. And that opening is very Takata and Fugue in D minor. Um, so here, uh, you know, we sort of get two flavors of the organ. Like is, you know, the first one certainly isn't conveying any kind of dread or anything. Um, the second one is kind of drawing on all of these, these Bach signifiers. And of course the Takata and Fugue gets used in, in horror. Um, Neil Lerner has, has work on that in film, sort of setting up the connotations um, in early what? Paramount films, things like that. Your award-winning article. Oh, yeah. I, I have an article on use of Bach, uh, the D minor Takata and Fugue in video games. <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll do that one at some point. Award-winning. It is award-winning. It is award-winning. Award winning. <laughs> yeah, the Bach Society gave me an award for it. And it yes. means that I get I get free uh, admittance into the Bach Society for like two years, uh, which is cool. Um, can go to the conferences and everything. We'll see where the, where they are, if they do any kind of hybrid options. But yeah, kind of cool. But yeah, so we can draw on um, kind of multiple signifiers in the same game um, by having two different moments of playing the organ. And then I had to play Golbez, because who doesn't love Golbez in Final Fantasy IV? I mean, it's iconic. He's very tall. And we get our kind of like fugy texture right there. Da, 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 da. Which itself sounds sounds almost quotey. <laughs> it's very close to a quotation of the D minor. Good stuff. I love that one. I've always loved that track. All right, so to sum up our pipe organ section, um, like the bells, the organ has come to symbolize the positive and negative emotional aspects of medievalism vis-a-vis -vis its connection to the distant Christian past. The shading of the Baroque organ and of Bach as medievalist stems from their conjoined presence in Gothic literature. As the bell arose from Victor Hugo, Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, so did the organ from Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the literature and film it inspired. Given the frequency in Gothic literature and early film of the supernatural, the occult, the mysterious, and the evil, the organ became tied to such emotional states and thus continues to transmit them in new media even when the subject matter is not explicitly religious or medievalist. Yeah, that may well have been my attempt at justifying <laughs> including the organ. I like it. I don't remember anymore like what I wrote when, you know, because it's been so long, but I feel like that might have been something that I tried to throw in there to be like, no, 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 no. It works though. It's it totally cool. works. And and again, I think just uh, even just the connection of the organ to church is is drawing on a lot of those, you know, Catholic y um medievalist signifiers. So I, 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 I'm sold. I don't I don't see how that's just because it's a later invention uh, doesn't make it any less medievalist, right? Yeah, because that's all medievalism is, is right. later inventions. <laughs> Finally we get wordless voice. Um and I love that you start here. You you mention um, John Haynes talks about how sort of our the way we think that chant sounds has to do with some of the earliest 
uh, recordings that got made, Mm -hmm. um, which are, of course, in a very specific uh, Salem style singing. Um, And so that that sort of dominates how we expect chant to sound. Um, And you you say here, particularly um, when we use melismatic passages in wordless voice, that that's really when we're evoking plain chant. And again, it evokes supernatural, um, ghostly elements, demonic elements, threats, fear, danger. Um, But it can also suggest holiness, um, protective versions. So it can also show up in some of the same spaces where maybe we're in a safe space, we're we're healing, we're at a safe point, you know, we're at any, I don't know, any of those types of spaces (laughs) can also signify nobility. There's kind of a refinement. And of course, uh, I don't think I have to play the opening of Halo for anybody. Uh, yesterday. <laughs> Sense of vastness, mystery, and religion. A very, very iconic opening to that game. And as uh, Marty said, it, it's in Dorian because that's a good monk key. <laughs> you have to separate those words because otherwise it sounds like monkey. It's in a good monkey. Monk key. But I loved your example here of the wordless voice recurring throughout the Spyro the Dragon series. So here we have um, going into the celestial caves in the Eternal Night. So here, you know, I think we're getting some of that sort of like, it's mystical. Um, There's sort of like a purity of the tone with the higher notes. You go, Spyro. And then that's getting blended in in interesting ways with some of the uh, kind of like battle cues and some of the the energy is sort of coming up from underneath. Um, Mm -hmm. But the voice itself seems to me to be kind of conveying like the caves being sort of ancient and maybe holy or mystical or something like that. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then we just combine it because these tropes are very good at combining with each other, (laughs) it turns out. Um, Shockingly. Shockingly. Um, Also, we have a great example here of... Uh, kind of a, a fearful, you know, version because I think almost everything in Bloodborne is fearful and dour and very gray. <laughs> that was actually one of my biggest issues with this game was the, like it's so not colorful, um, and they they seem to have changed that a little bit because um, Elden Ring. Uh, as, as soon as I saw some gameplay, I was like, oh, there's color in this game because this one is so like like these massive sprawling Victorian cities and everything is just like black and gray. <laughs> And like muted, um, which really just adds to the heaviness. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this of course has some of our, our same sorts of tropes here. But you mentioned it starts out with uh, the string duet and um, sort of the intensity, but we add in the choral elements. I'm going to jump a little bit. So notice now we have that sort of low choral sound. Very dissonant. And of course we have the shrieks of the actual actual witch. So Karen, I'm wondering here about the 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 stratification of the the register here that we've got the mm. the low choral sound with the solo kind of piercing high vocal and sort of how does that how does that combine here what is, what is that doing um i mean for me when i talk about this sort of thing when you hear the like the super low guttural or rough men's vocals really kind of taps into that sense of violence and and uh aggression Mm -hmm. Uh, but 
and, and this is sort of like something that I, I feel like this this area needs to be expanded on a lot. There's a lot of room here to expand on this because there's like all sorts of like, I don't know, cognitive musicology out there that could tap into why low sounds, you know, what's the difference between low and high or rough and smooth and things like that. And why do they have these particular connotations, but like the high soaring piercingness, it, you know, it's like, we get this idea of like this, um, some sort of like an, an ancient narrator, you know, uh, an ancient, witness something that's uh shrieking out a warning yeah you know um or you know like it's almost like like this like epic bard like i'm telling you the story of what's happening recording it for posterity because this is a big moment you know um that's that's sort of some of the bifurcation that i does that sort of answer it a yeah little bit, you know? yeah and and in this case like it isn't the the sort of high you know female sounding or female reading voice mm -hmm. that is being like the holy pure here mm -hmm. it's like a shriek it's very high emotionality um and it's it's actually playing with the sort of like grumbling like undertone the the unrest created by the lower choir um, so they, they're actually really beautiful play, playing together. They're playing mm -hmm. with each other, not against each other. Um, and I, so I liked that one too. Um, yeah, the ancient, mm -hmm. ancient ideas. Um, but certainly the, uh, the attack of the voice, you know, having that, the dynamic and the, the sort of shriek affect versus a more pure tone, less vibrato, you know, sort of, uh, timelessness that mm -hmm. we might have. Like, it's very easy through some of these, these other musical elements to make it swing one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much to be said about wordless voices. Like, I feel like this is, this is just the tip of the iceberg as to what there is to say. Yeah. And do you have, uh, you have some, some future work on, wordless voice is still to come right I yeah believe. there's a there's a little bit it, it, there's a hint of it in the renaissance chapter but I, I don't really go into it there um voices are in fact minimal in that chapter but it is going to play a role in the chapter for the gender book yeah because uh, mm -hmm. i i did a paper at the 2019 nacfagum here at heart uh about gendered voices basically female female presenting female or female presenting voices in video games um from the perspective of of timbre and vibrato uh and a lot of it is based on like wordless wordless voices mm -hmm. um there's a lot of work that needs to be done there for me to make that argument with i think the last three years have shown that there's a lot even more nuance to be added to that discussion from the perspectives of, of gender and 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 interpretation yeah. thereof uh so it's it's got to be careful but um yeah that's going to be a big part of that chapter yeah so stay tuned for that the gender book itself is going to be a fun thing to stay tuned for <laughs> yeah for sure uh so then in by way of conclusion uh, as you know all of these examples all of these tropes what makes them so poignant and important to discuss is not just that they're polyvalent not their ability to signify the medievalist but the possibility that the polyvalence might be injurious um, apologies for my typos. I shouldn't do these the night before at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> Notions of goodness, peace, safety, healing, and spirituality on one hand, desolation, superstition, danger, violence, evil, and death on the other are not simply emotional states. They stem directly from a long history of stereotypes about the medieval period. Yeah. So we have to contend with that, that issue, um, yeah. and, and recognize that those beliefs can create amusing, anachronistic fantasy versions of the medieval, but they can also create harmful, insidious versions, ones that reinforce ideas of the medieval as all Christian, all white, all male, all powerful, all universal, which have led to some attempts to remake the present and the past twisted image. We cannot change how certain musical sounds have been associated with medievalist contexts in the past, nor can we completely eliminate their medievalist overtones from our oral memories. Yet, when we continue to rely on those sounds to create or reinforce the emotional states with which they have become so slowly linked, I suggest that we inadvertently imbue the new context with a mythological, even tainted idea of the medieval past. So basically, it's important here to recognize that um, medievalism is this modern construction and um, pretending that it is somehow authentic, uh, again, there's that word <laughs> in quotes, um, that it is somehow, you know, an accurate representation, uh, again, of, of what, a thousand years of history, <laughs> um, 
we really have to sort of recognize that like, no, this is, this is its own thing. Um, and let's, let's look at the way that stereotypes are getting um, reinforced and reified and replicated. Yeah. Yeah. And I get into this more in some of my other work where I can kind of back up that this is, this is a, this is like a bell I've been sounding, no pun intended for for a (laughs) while. Uh, Because the more I do work on, you know, sonic rep- representations of the medieval, the more that I feel like they're really tying into some really harmful stere- stereotypes about the medieval that are continuously being co-opted for really, really bad things. And mm-hmm. so I just, I think it behooves us to be aware of the fact that these these sounds aren't um, somehow divorced from all of their scenarios. They're not divorced from these other ideas of, of the medieval. They're everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and they're not always linking up with things, even when they seem harmful, or I mean, I, even when they seem like totally neutral, they could be, they could be potentially harmful. Like we're talking about, Oh, you know, this is, this is, this is a symbol of the ancient past. Well, who's, who's ancient past? Who do we mm-hmm. think was there? Mm-hmm. Right. I, I go into depth, more depth with like the voice with the examples of like, well, you know, a lot of the, the vocal types that we're analyzing or that we're thinking of are in, in many cases like there's a lot of there's a lot of connections you can point out between some of the medievalist vocal stereotypes and and like very white presenting voices, which is not to say that I know who the artists are. That's not a that's not a, any sort of critique uh, whatsoever. But, um, you know, there aren't games, for example, that use other kinds of vocal types that might be more immediately recognizable. And again, it's just so hard to say because it feels like I'm, I'm stereotyping vo- voice types and I, I don't want to do that. But, um, you know, there's a lot of kinds of music out there that are a little bit more um, recognized by modern ears as belonging to certain kinds of cultures or mm-hmm. ethnicities or whatever have you that you won't see being used in these contexts because the 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 idea is that well those folks weren't there right and they were you know and i whoever the they was right there's no such thing as an as an all white europe um, right. you know so it, it worries me because it's it's a very very complicated thing to try to explain without relying on stereotypes to bake back up your point about stereotypes <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so you end up you end up in this loop <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it's it's hard because I don't I don't want to misspeak or misstep uh, and and you know come off as as though I'm making a point that I'm not trying to make. But uh, I definitely think that there's a way pl- plentiful connections between these musical tropes and Christianity. And Europe wasn't Christian; it wasn't all Christian. Right. So, like in the keynote, I and I know we're over time. Sorry, but in the oh, keynote, no I was talking about how we never. We never have any medievalist games with Jewish people in them. Where right. where are the Jewish people in all the medievalist games? Where's where are the Muslims? And, and unless they're the bad guys, right? right? And, and and Assassin's Creed aside, but um, mm-hmm. you know that's a that's a very different different kind of game there. So I don't know. I just I wonder if we can think through what some of these sounds might be telling us, even when we don't think that's what they're doing. Yeah. Oh. And there, it, yeah. it, as you mentioned in your keynote, there are this is this has been a thread of interest to groups of medievalists that are are really starting to tease apart, um, sort of diversifying our our understanding of oh my goodness yes who was in Europe. I bow to them. I mean, they're doing such amazing work, and they're doing it in in many cases at at actual physical and mental peril. Yeah. Uh, you know, this isn't easy work. It's very complex work. I don't pretend to have the same breadth and depth of knowledge that they do because they come to the field from the perspective of history writ large or maybe literary theory, and I'm coming at it from the musical side. Uh, but I think that our work dovetails well, but I, I highly recommend people look at the like the medievalists of color group uh, and the work of people like um, Dorothy Kim and Sita Changati, uh, Chaganti, Sorry, Jonathan Sai, um, Mary Rambaran Olm, who's currently having the worst time uh, on Twitter right now because uh, you know, she, she wrote a book review uh, about a, a new medieval history written by two white professors and she critiqued it and it wasn't it was a very honest and very pleasant review, but it got it got blocked. 
and now people are accusing her of not being black. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know, like her actual race and ethnicity are being called into question because she had the audacity to write a book review that didn't praise these white professors who have now blocked her on social media. The whole Aye. thing is just a gigantic mess. And it's like, this is the kind of thing that people doing this work are up against. And so far I haven't had to deal with it in large part because my work has a much limited, much more limited sphere. Uh, yeah. And because I have the privilege of being uh, a, a white female scholar, uh, but, you know, it's like they're doing a lot of really good work and I'm, I'm trying to use their work in as good faith and uh, uh, appropriate context as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah. And those are definitely some uh, resources that we could put in the, um, the, the channel, the re- what a, I don't remember what I, what I call it, <laughs> for the reading resource channel in the, in the Discord. Yeah. Stream shares. That's what I called it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we could put a couple, um, you know, maybe link to the medievalists of color group and um, maybe even just a couple names or um, kind of further reading for folks that are interested in this. But yeah, happy to. Does anybody have any? I know we are a little over, so I don't want to keep you too long. But um, I'm curious if anybody in the chat has any questions. I know there was a little bit of back and forth kind of throughout and uh, you yeah. were able to respond in real time. Yeah, and folks can always contact me through your Discord or the Ludo Discord mm-hmm. or email if, if you want to chat more about it. Um, like I said, this is only one of the articles where I'm sort of making the the claim at the end that we should be kind of rethinking what some of these sounds are doing. So if, if you're not entirely sold with this particular article, that's okay. Um, I'd love to hear people's, people's thoughts and, uh, you know... Uh, critiques whatever have you yeah I think this this was like I said one that I I was really excited because uh there there are a lot of good publications from you in particular to choose from so um for the streams edification I was I was sort of like hey Karen like what's one that you don't feel like you get to talk about enough (laughs) like what's one that you know we've all talked about Civ 4 a lot uh and rightly so but uh, you know maybe there's there's something else that uh was was a good one. You brought this one up and I was like, Oh, good. <laughs> Let's do this one. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, you know, the whole point of this, this stream is to sort of, uh, bolster everybody's reading lists and sort of exposure. And especially when something gets published outside of one of the major video game edited collections or J um, you know, it, th- there's a possibility that it's just not on the radar, um, or or not in the accessibility um, th- for someone's institution. So, um, yeah, post medieval, I know. Depending on where I've been, I haven't been able to get access to it always. So, yeah, it's really nice to be able to to highlight this one. Not that you shouldn't read Civ Four, like required reading. Go read the Civ Four <laughs> chapter. Thanks. Like that. That's one you should just have under your belt. Uh, as a Ludo musicologist, but it, this is a, a really good. I like what I like about this one is it does feel like an extension of the the blog posts that you've done, and it's it's sort of continued uh, refinement of the ideas. And the goal is to kind of put this into a book at some point, right? To sort of make a yeah, I'd like to start work on down the big, line <laughs> like medievalism and music. I got to get through the yeah. last of the sabbatical and the new stuff, but yeah. eventually there will be a book. Yeah. Eventually, um, and I'm sure that's going to be heavily cited. And um, I just, I just love the way that you know, you you're never just like, oh, here here's a trope. Like <laughs> you're not just playing a game of identify the trope. Um, you are always looking at the, these ramifications and sort of setting up these, these really thought provoking ideas about, you know, what, what is, what is this saying? It's kind of doing multiple things. And, um, what are the, the consequences of continuing to replicate these? And that, that's what really takes this a step above. Cause I think, um, too often, um, uh, kind of topic theory trope research, you know, tends to fall into just, here, here it is. Here, like, here's the trope. Um, and that in itself doesn't tend to be very interesting. It's, it's sort of like, okay, well, what does, what does it mean that this trope is here and what is it doing? So. Yeah. Well, I look forward to continuing to work on it. I, I know that this is just, like I said, the beginning, there's so much more to be said and I may or may not always be the right person to do the work, but I'm going to try to do it to the best of my ability. So I'm always open to suggestions and feedback. Yeah. We're so lucky to have you. Oh, uh, thank you. 
here on the stream team, <laughs> you know, certainly at heart getting to work with, with that group of students. Um, you know, th there have been some really interesting papers to come out of students you've worked with. For sure. Um, so it's, it's, it's so good to have you in the field and as a friend. Oh, thank you. Hearts. Thank you. <laughs> Big heart emojis. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the stream. I will ha I will be having you back again because you have some other great publications. Um, cool. So maybe maybe down the line we'll, we'll pick up another one. Um, join us next week for uh, we're going to be looking at Ryan Thompson's chapter in the Green Book, the classic Green Book, um, Music and the Role Playing Games. Uh, Heroes and Harmonies, and of course his chapter in the Green Book is the Final Fantasy VI chapter, uh, where he's sort of positing that the entire game is uh, matching the structure of the opera, uh, has does some really interesting work there, um, and we just thought, that's fun, because we're, we're streaming the Pixel, Pixel Remaster on Thursdays this month. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to try right. to get through the rest of the game this month with some guests, so I was like, let's, have, let's do that one from Ryan. <laughs> Uh, cool. yeah so that'll be next week and uh, if you need a link to the discord DM me I'm happy to send those out and we'll post some further resources there uh, but yeah see you next week at 2pm eastern thanks so much cool. thanks folks <laughs>